Why did you agree to let me make this documentary about you? Well, unfortunately, I don't know how to say no. And when a friend asks me, I normally will say yes. But in this case, I would also like to probably push ahead and tell people, here we have a group of compounds, an endogenous system of major importance. It is not being used uh, as much as it should be in the clinic. It is of great promise in the clinic. Let's try to push it forward. And maybe this film can push it forward a bit. Hopefully. Hopefully. One of the topics that I decided to work on was the chemistry of the plant cannabis sativa. Cannabis had been used for thousands of years, both as a drug as a recreational agent, but surprisingly, uh, the active compound was never isolated in pure form. I decided, together with uh, uh, my colleague Yechiel Gaoni, to go and do research and find out what are the compounds present in cannabis, and particularly, what is the active compound, active compounds present there. Well, a scientist should try to find topics of importance. And uh, I, I thought that this is a topic of importance. I knew that the police have a lot of uh, cannabis hashish that's being smuggled from the Lebanon, and after all the legal things were completed, they usually burn it. I was at the Weizmann Institute at that time, a very young person. I went to the director of the Weizmann Institute, the administrative director, and asked him, do you know anybody in the police who can supply hashish to us for research? So he called one of his uh, friends, can you supply uh, cannabis to one of our researchers? And I hear from the other side, somebody shouting, is he, meaning me, is he reliable? And uh, the administrative director, who actually almost didn't know me, said, yes, of course he's reliable. Let him come over and pick some cashish. I went over, I didn't have a car, took a bus, got five kilos of hashish, went on the bus, and people in the bus after 15, 20 minutes just started asking, what the hell is this smell, very unusual smell? I mean, I had five kilos of hashish in my bag going around. But I guess you're the only person in the world that took five kilos of hashish from the police and got away with it. Well, uh, probably yes. It turned out that the police were not allowed to give us cannabis. I didn't have the permit from the Ministry of Health, therefore I had broken the law and the police had broken the law and we should go to prison. Well, it doesn't work that way. I went to the Ministry of Health and some of them were colleagues of mine and the others knew what I was doing, so I said, I apologize, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. Next time when I want hashish, I'll go to the ministry. If and when I needed hashish, I went to the Ministry of Health, I filled the form, I drank some coffee with them, they gave me the permit, I went with the permit every time to the police, the police, I drank some more coffee with them, and I got my hashish and went back to the lab. We started working on those five kilos of hashish. We didn't have a safe, it was just in one of the cupboards in the lab. Nobody really was that interested. So we started extracting it. We started using modern methods. Now, this is important. Up till the mid-60s, even before that, in order to find the structure of a compound, one had to do a lot of reactions. Then, and we were one of the first to do that in Israel, we found that by using the proper instruments, one could find the structure of compounds without doing a lot of chemistry. We put the compound on a column. It is absorbed here, if there are two or three compounds. This is the way we separated originally the compounds from cannabis. But that was many, many, many years ago. 
we separate about 10 or 12 compounds, and these compounds included the only one active compound. Active, we tested at that time in monkeys. I had a colleague who worked in a nearby institute, and he had a colony of monkeys, and he and his group indeed tested these compounds in monkeys, and surprisingly found that only one compound did anything in these monkeys. It sedated them. They didn't sleep, but they were sedated. On the basis of this particular observation, we decided there is just one active compound. And surprisingly, this is true to this very day. There is only one major active compound, uh, which is named now delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol THC. And this compound causes essentially all the hashish type, cannabis type effects that we know so well. If you really look at the history and what's been going on ever since he discovered THC, it's not just discovered THC and then just, you know, relied on that and didn't do much, but he continued to have such a vision for the next step and the next step and the next step. Nine, eight, is that a test for whether I'm intoxicated or not? Yes. <laughs> My name is Mahmoud A. El Soli. I am a research professor at the University of Mississippi. Cannabis is what I'm known for. Cannabis is a very old plant, a very old medicine, if you will, that people have used it for so many indications over the years. In the literature, marijuana has been used for all different types of things. One would say, well, you know, this is crazy. This is no such plant that can, you know, do all of this. And, and today, it's very easy to really go back to this old literature about the different indications for which marijuana was prescribed and find out that uh, there is justification for that. Cannabis was used in the Middle East for thousands of years. As medicine. Who knows, maybe for other things as well. Many of the tribes at the time used cannabis. Assyrians used it for medicine, used it for excitation, as used it in religion. The Egyptians used it as medicine. Surprisingly, the Greeks and the Romans didn't know about the uh, psychoactivity, but they used the uh, cannabis as an uh, anti-inflammatory drug. Cannabis in India was used by people who want to be delivered from all worries and care. Well, that's quite a good definition of anti-anxiety. We knew that cannabis had been used for epilepsy. In the past? In the past. There is, for example, a translation of Arab story of the 15th century, and it says that one of the Arab leaders had epilepsy. Physician came over and gave him cannabis, and it cured him, but he had to take it for his entire life. So the field kind of told us, try it on epilepsy. We first tried it in animals and it worked. So at this point, we decided to go into humans. Trial took place in Sao Paulo. They had about 10 people that had epilepsy that could not be affected by the known drugs. We started giving them high doses of cannabidiol, 200 milligrams per day. And you were producing the cannabidiol from hashish? For almost 40 years, we didn't produce it. We isolated it. We separated it from hashish. Hashish contains about 4%, 5% cannabidiol. So it is really quite difficult to isolate, to obtain uh, large amounts. But we did that. We were happy to note that indeed they had no seizures while they were taking cannabidiol. And it was published, and nothing happened afterwards. So far, 34 years later, this is the only publication of cannabidiol in humans against epilepsy. So in 1995, you had an idea of testing THC on children. It has been known for many years that cannabis can lower the effects of um, anti-cancer drugs. Anti-cancer drugs, many of them, 
cause terrible side effects. And in children, unfortunately children get cancer as well, children vomit and uh, want to vomit, have nausea, they are really in a bad shape. And they cry all the time, and their parents are in a bad shape. Luckily, most of the children can be cured of the cancer, but the treatment is absolutely difficult. We wanted to do a clinical trial in children. And we did that with Professor Avramov, Aya Avramov. She was head of the Department of uh, Pediatric Oncology in one of the Jerusalem hospitals. And we did a major study with uh, THC given in oily drops under the tongue of children. Obviously, children cannot smoke. We had children that were not even one year old. We dropped, or she dropped, THC in oil, in olive oil, under the tongue at two or three times a day, small doses, during the anti-cancer treatment. At the beginning, we wanted to do a double-blind study. Some of the children got the THC, some other children got only the olive oil. After a week, she told me I'm not going ahead with that. I know exactly who is getting the THC. I know exactly who is not getting it. There was a complete separation. Those that didn't get it continued to vomit. So she went ahead doing an open study and she gave THC, pure THC, under the tongue about 400 times, which means that the, those that were involved in the experiment got it every time they were treated with whatever they were being treated. And at the end we saw that we had complete, complete block of vomiting, complete block of nausea by small amount of THC, which did not cause any uh, psychoactivity, nothing. So here we had a complete therapeutic effect and we published that. And again, essentially nothing happened. Finito, that was it. It's still not being used in children. And you think it's, it's a good idea to use it for well, children? Well, I believe it's an excellent idea because we help those children that suffer. But uh, I have no influence on oncologists. A very serious group of uh, researchers has recently published a paper saying that the endocannabinoid system is involved in essentially all human diseases. If you combine CB1 receptors and CB2 receptors, they cover most of the organism, at least in mammals. We are mammals. We are mammals. Okay. But uh, when you talk of mammals, you talk of uh, horses and dogs and mice and rats and rabbits and lions and... We all share the endocannabinoid system. I believe so. I believe so. And it has been demonstrated in many species. Because now suddenly everyone has cannabis in their bodies, or everyone has a cannabinoid in their bodies, so it can't be bad. These molecules that we all have are so critical from the birth to the death of each of us in health and disease. The National Institute of Health gave me an award recently. In 1962, I had asked for a grant from NIH. But NIH wrote me back, well, the topic you're interested in, namely the constituents of cannabis sativa, is not a relevant topic for the US. It's not used in the US. When you have something more relevant, ask us for a grant. So a year later, I got a phone call from one of the main pharmacologists of the National Institute of Mental Health, said he's interested in cannabis. So all of a sudden they had a change of mind. So I asked them, what happened? Well, apparently somebody high up, an important person, maybe a senator, had called NIH and asked, uh, what does cannabis do? It seems that his son had been caught smoking pot. What? Yes, yes, it's the truth, Father. And I'm pretty, pretty ashamed of it. And he wanted to know whether the marijuana destroys his mind. Now, they didn't know anything about marijuana, and the only 
thing that they actually knew was that a young person from the Middle East had asked for a grant and was working on it. So a pharmacologist came over and asked me, are you still working? I said, yes, we had just identified the active compound and we had a large amount of the active stuff there. We had about 10 grams of THC. So he said, please give us the 10 grams and we'll do a lot of pharmacology in the US. So he got the world supply of THC, nobody had THC at that time, got the world supply of THC, took it to the US. Actually, he probably smuggled it because I don't think that he had a license so uh, he could take it to the US. But then of course, nobody was looking for THC, it was not a known compound. So he took it to NIH, and for the next couple of years, most of the research in the U.S. on THC was done with material supplied by us, those grams that uh, they took. And for many years, nearly 40, 45 years, I was supported financially by the National Institute of Health. And they never, never interfered with my research. I would consider myself still as a mouse geneticist and neurobiologist. So our approach is to make uh, mutant animals. So almost every talk that you hear contains some data that were generated with the mice that, that we generated, that we made. You get seniority if death you can avoid. The lab was up to me. I chose cannabinoids Heard it's a fun house where a little lab mouse can party For several years I was um, researching uh, motor neuron disease, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and was able to show that uh, THC was actually uh, protective for in the mouse model of ALS. Uh, the mice that were given THC, uh, lived a little longer and did a little better than the ones that uh, did not get treated with, with THC. So that was really exciting work. Pass that new compound over to me, doc. Then I swim around, you can punch the clock. Work on mice has been done in so many areas that I normally joke, saying that if I were a mouse, I can be treated for just about every disease around. Well, it is partly true. I ain't cynical, life's a clinical trial for a mouse or man. Anandamide and 2-AG, although they were discovered uh, almost 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, they have never, never been administered to a human. So we speak about mice. Well, mice are... Mm, uh, 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 Nice animals, but they are not definitely not humans. Let me nibble your cannabigibaro. Just let me nibble, nibble your cannabigibaro. Obviously, mice can be treated with cannabinoids for cancer. Mice can be treated for all kinds of other diseases, which in humans, the answer is no, it has not been tested.